So now we're going to continue our look on what we were establishing previously uh, that we entitled Landscape plus Regional Conservation. And now this is the second part to that idea, so we'll do Roman numeral 2. So Landscape plus Regional Conservation 2. Here we're going to look at some more, I would say, concrete uh, efforts to conserve the landscape and regional ideas that we've established. For example, a good way to understand this type of conservation is to look at something known as movement corridors. Previously, we established the idea of edges and that they are the result of habitat fragmentation and though sometimes they can be good for some very specific well-adapted species, for the most part they decrease biodiversity. For the most part, most animals are not successful in edges. So what we're going to be doing in movement corridors are essentially, if you remember when I created, you know, this is our large expansive habitat and let's say we create an edge and we create maybe even another edge here and another edge here, we create this very fragmented environment. What we're trying to do with movement corridors is imagine the idea of connecting two of the small, rectan small rectangles that we have in this larger rectangle. So imagine that with this, we are trying to eliminate one of these rectangles that I drew and uh, ex uh, basically create this whole region that I'm coloring in as one simple whole region that's a movement corridor instead of two separate entities that they previously were as a result of the fragmentation that happened. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to connect two small rectangles in some way. When we have a movement corridor, we're going to have some direct effects of this connection. Most of the time, we'll actually be promoting dispersal, which is good. We're getting more genetic variation. So if we promote dispersal, we certainly will be in promoting genetic variation. And we also will be promoting gen uh, genetic variation by preventing uh, inbreeding. So that's always good. So we prevent inbreeding because we're creating a bit of a larger uh, overall habitat and we're promoting the dispersal of organisms because, again, the habitat's getting a bit more expansive, a bit larger because you're connecting two of those small rectangles and making them one bigger rectangle. Problem is, when you have these movement corridors, there, of course, are costs and benefits to these actions that we do. This actually will also then, as a consequence, promote the spread because we're creating a larger area, of course. This actually promotes the spread of parasites and disease. So that's a natural consequence that we have to live with uh, of parasites, uh, not of, but and diseases. It's a natural consequence that we have to understand that will be the result of trying to fix these fragmentation uh, errors or these fragmentation problems that we see via movement corridors. Now, in addition, through this idea of landscape and regional conversation, uh, conservation, there's this idea of protected areas. And protected areas are not uh, absolutely new to most people. Most people know that there are protected areas on Earth. We could more specifically consider these protected areas. Uh, these uh, A better term would be something like biodiversity hotspots. It's a much better conservation biologist term to define these protected areas. Biodiversity hotspots. What do these encompass? For the most part, these biodiversity hotspots are a rather small area, a very confined small area, in which we have numerous very much many, so uh, um, endemic species, numerous endemic species. Um, the idea, this term endemic just means found nowhere else. So I'll put that on the side here for endemic just means found nowhere else besides this biodiversity hotspot in this small area. Also, this is a hotspot because most of the time in this small area, in this very fragmented area, we usually would also see things like threatened and endangered species being housed here as well. Threatened plus endangered species. So you can already imagine that this is of course going to be a protected area because it has these species that are only found here. It's a small area. It has threatened and endangered species within it. But the problem is it's actually quite difficult to truly identify whether or not something that you stumble upon as a conservation biologist 
is really a biodiversity hotspot. It involves a lot more than just having these components, but these are the basic components that we can understand as a biodiversity hotspot uh, requires. These are these things that are definitely necessary for anything to be even remotely considered a biodiversity hotspot. Other protected areas include nature preserves. Um, and we see these uh, a lot of the times, and here in these nature preserves, we are going to have, for the most part, what we would consider protected, because they're of course protected areas, islands of biodiversity. And they're not literally islands, but we're just saying they're only going to be uh, accessible to a very few amount of people. So uh, it's definitely an island in that sense. Protected islands of biodiversity with usually uh, habitat altered by human activity. So large nature preserves uh, uh, and reserves are seen in like uh, Africa and South Africa and that's what we see with this idea here with habitat altered by, let me finish my thought, human activity. There we go. Okay. So that's an idea of a nature preserve. Um, a big problem here, not a problem necessarily, but something important to keep in mind is the management of these preserves. Um, what has to happen is that uh, because these are rather humanly constructed, they, there is a need for natural disturbances of some sort. Meaning that um, we're going to actually try to, for example, let's say we have a fire-dependent ecosystem. Fire dependent ecosystem um, like those uh, pine barrens that we see like let's say pine forest remember how I said that that woodpecker needs those controlled fires this is something that we have to keep in mind when we're managing these preserves and also we have to figure out do we want many small preserves or would we rather have a few large of them? And this is a question that we have to ask ourselves. So this is something that's, from the management perspective, things to keep in mind in terms of these protected areas. Last thing to understand about landscape and regional conservation here, at least, is the idea of urban ecology. Something pretty familiar to many people. This is the idea of a very modern idea of species preservation in some of the most non, let's say, places, a place that you would certainly not expect species preservation, uh, specifically in uh, large scale cities. So we'll say in cities. Uh, and this is going to be a, an attempt to have a balance. What we're trying to do in this urban ecological process is balance species preservation within the needs of the the highly condensed highly packed people let's say within needs of the people of that city and this is usually seen through a classic example of urban ecology is the idea that you have the capital of the business world and right in the middle of Manhattan you have this huge large large central park and that's a basic component of urban ecology of balancing this species preservation within the needs of the people the needs of the people are to have you know a central hub the the center of the world the capital of the world New York City right Manhattan and right in the middle of it you have this nice large green pasture uh, central park so that's a very cool example of urban ecology and uh, a more of a hipster example of urban ecology would be those rooftop gardens that you would see, let's say, um, in places like Brooklyn, uh, in Williamsburg even, uh, if you're from New York City. These rooftop gardens, again, these are within the needs of people. They're, it's within an apartment complex, large apartment complex, large human structure. But what do we do? We put a garden on top of it. And we try to preserve plant species, let's say, within an urban city environment. So it's a really cool way of trying to do some sort of landscape and regional conservation through this very modern mindset.